Well, good afternoon, everyone. Just a few people are wanting to return that greeting. Anyway, I'm Giovanni Singleton, Lunch Poems Coordinator. Thank you all for being here in the lovely Morrison Library. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's sort of relaxing and um, filled to overflowing with poetry as we celebrate National Poetry Month. Isn't that exciting? Yay! So first, I'd like to invite you all to sign up on our email list, which is over on the librarian's desk. Um, we also have posters, um, which outlines this year's Complete Lunch Poems program. So be sure and pick one up, because we do have one more event um, left this season. Also on our website, lunchpoems.berkeley.edu, you can view this reading and all of our past readings on YouTube, where we have our very own channel. And last I counted, it was about 84 videos. Um, so do check them out. Our next event takes place here on May 2nd. It's our final event of the season, and it's our annual student reading. So please do come back and, and join us. So now, please join me in welcoming uh, Lunch Poems director, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, who will introduce this afternoon's reader. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, ben Lerner began his literary career by writing three books of poetry, and then made the rather dubious decision to betray the genre and become a famous novelist, which then allowed him to write a uh, book of nonfiction as well called The Hatred of Poetry, continuing um, at least an ostensible treasonousness. But um, actually, all of his work in other genres besides poetry has been radically, emphatically, sensitively about poetry. So rather than thinking of him as a traitor, I'd like to think of him as an invasive species <laughs> who's taking poetry out further into the world where other people might notice that it finds ways to persist. That thought about poetry across genre has been um, a spectacular meditation on what poetry can do and what it can't do. Um, TLDR, it can't do very much, but that very little is quite important. Um, Ben's project across those genres, and especially within poetry, I think has had to do with um, what possibilities can be imagined for and in language while watching it be cheapened, emptied, mercantilized, and weaponized in all these ways that have huge material effects on the world, even if poetry itself cannot. Um, in order to do that work within poetry, Ben has often repaired to really ancient means, whether those are patterns of repetition that border on the refrain, um, or forms of rhyme that may not look like rhyme. He's also been an astute student of modernism and language poetry and many recent moments in, in um, our work, such that he knows how to disrupt syntax, make it glitch and stutter and forget itself. His work really is a parade of the old and new that dramatizes or models or offers this really raw, open, and unended thinking about what poetry might have to acquire in order to be other to all the kinds of acts of language that it finds disastrous and to which it wants its a minor opposition to hold. Let's hear some of his most recent work that I think continues that worthy venture, Ben Lerner. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Giovanni, for all your work in making this possible. And thank you, Jeffrey, uh, for the lovely introduction. And also, Jeffrey has been kind of my first reader for everything I've written since I met him in Berkeley when I lived here briefly in 2005. So um, if the poems don't seem good to you, you can blame Jeffrey <laughs> for failing to fix them when he, when he had the chance. Um, thank you all for coming. There are a lot of angles. I don't know how to take you all in, so I'm going to kind of look at the, look at the paper. This poem, uh, this recent poem is called Index of Themes. 
poems about night and related poems. Paintings about night, sleep, death, and the stars. I know one poem from school under the stars, but belong to no school of poetry. I forgot it by heart. I remember only it was set in the world and its theme parted. Poems about stars and how they are erased by street lights, streets and a poem about force and the schools within it. We learned all about night in college, how it applies. Night college under the stars where we made love a subject. I completed my study of form and forgot it. Tonight, poems about summer and the stars are sorted by era over me, also poems about grief and dance. I thought I'd come to you with these themes like my senses. Do you remember me from the world? I was set there and we spoke on the green, likening something to prison, something to film, poems about dreams like moths about street lights until the cliches glow soft glow of the screen comes off on our hands, blueprints on the windows. How pretentious to be alive now, let alone again, like poetry and poems indexed by cadences falling about us while parting. It was important to part yesterday in a serial work about lights so that distance could enter the voice and address you tonight. Poems about you, prose poems. I became um, interested at one point in, the, in the, the legal fiction by which corporations are ascribed the rights of individuals, um, something you're all familiar with. And uh, I, was, I was kind of trying to remember this older Whitmanic fantasy about a collective um, person or a transpersonal subject that could be interested in something other than the maximization of profit. So I'll read a couple poems that kind of come out of um, trying to remember the good, the good fantasy that right now is often um, the bad reality of corporate personhood. Uh, but this poem is called Autotune. Am I too loud or too quiet? Is this about okay? Okay, let me, let me know if I'm yelling at you. Autotune, one, the phase vocoder bends the pitch of my voice towards a norm. Our ability to correct sung pitches was the unintended result of an effort to extract hydrocarbons from the earth. The technology was first developed by an engineer at Exxon to interpret seismic data. The first poet in English whose name is known learned the art of song in a dream. Bede says, by his verse, the minds of many were often excited to despise the world. When you resynthesize the frequency domain of a voice, there is audible phase smearing, a kind of vibrato, but instead of signifying the grain of a particular performance, the smear signifies the recuperation of particularity by the normative. I want to sing of the seismic activity deep in the earth and the destruction of the earth for profit and a voice whose particularity has been extracted by machine. I want the recuperation of my voice, a rescaling of its frequency domain to be audible when I'm called upon to sing. Two. Cadman didn't know any songs, so he withdrew from the others in embarrassment. Then he had a dream in which he was approached, probably by a god, and asked to sing the beginning of created things. His withdrawing, not the hymn that he composed in the dream, is the founding moment of English poetry. Here my tone is bending towards an authority I don't claim founding moment, but the voice itself is a created thing and corporate. The larynx operates within socially determined parameters we learn to modulate. You cannot withdraw and sing, at least not intelligibly. You can only sing in a corporate voice of corporate things. Three, the voice, 
notable only for its interchangeability, describes the brightest object in the sky after the sun, claims love will be made beneath it, a voice leveled to the point that I can think of it as mine. But because this voice does not modulate the boundaries of its intelligibility dynamically, it is meaningless. I can think of it as mine, but I cannot use it to express anything. The de-skilling of the singer makes the song transpersonal at the expense of content. In this sense, the music is popular. Most engineers aspire to conceal the corrective activity of the phase vocoder if the process is not concealed, if it's overused and a natural warble and the voice results and correction passes into distortion. The voice no longer sounds human, but the sound of a computer's voice is moving as if our technology wanted to remind us of our power to sing the beginning of created things. This is the sound of our collective alienation and in that sense is corporate. As if from emotion, the phase smears as the voice describes the diffuse reflection of the sun at night. Four, in a voice without portamento, a voice in which the human is felt as a loss, I want to sing the permanent wars of profit. I don't know any songs, but won't withdraw. I am dreaming the pathetic dream of a pathos capable of redescription so that corporate personhood becomes more than legal fiction. It's a dream in prose of poetry, a long dream of waking. I thought I'd, I'd read you this poem that I wrote um, for C.D. Wright. Uh, who, I guess it's been two years since she passed away or something, but it was, it's, I'm still in denial about it, but it, I kind of wrote this in the, in the, in the wake of that loss. Um, the poem is called, also known as Hertzsickle, Cyanide Flower, and Bachelor's Button. Light snow falling in the listening area. Something has to keep me from the radio and other forms of incidental contact like the current time is or I see silver plunging in the days ahead. Why not poetry? AM clouds give way to PM sun. I wish I'd written that and did and publish it on air the way a match publishes in my hand before I hold it to the cigarette I took from my first teacher's sun and light snow at her improvised wake, contract pneumonia there, let it bloom in the left lung for a while, then postpone Berlin. I discourage you from flying is the nicest thing anyone has ever, except maybe the command to look alive when I was a boy undead among small purple flowers in the outfield. The plan was to wander around Kreuzberg mourning her, but this will do. Overheard forecasts, adjustments to internal flora, light snow that turns to rain in time, just not for anything. If you turn literally inward, touch the breastbone with radiation, locate a shadow then, the tech will print you out an image, freeing up the elegy for other things, like wandering beyond the field of play while base is empty. They're talking about the off-season, beautiful phrase that's mine and now it's gone. Cornflower, blue bottle, the involucre is urn-shaped and the margins are regularly cleft. Thrives on roadsides, thrives on waste sites, is sometimes toothed or lobed. There's this poem um, by Brecht called To Those Who Follow or To Those Who Come After. I don't have any German, so I rely on the translations. And this poem, again, thinking about corporate personhood, a little steals um, from him, and he makes uh, a, brief, a brief appearance in it. Um, it's called Dilation, and it's written in, in three parts. One. 
We need to harness the vaguely erotic disappointment that attends the realization you aren't being followed. Keys gripped between the fingers, ready to strike at the eyes. The after image of Byzantine gold leaf dissolving in the trees when we emerge from the museum must be harnessed. And the delicate carnation of the sky at the rooftop screening and the dress of the hostess, its exploration of formative drives. If you are anything like me, you emerge from the hospital's automatic doors into the heat and glare of its parking lot, unable to recall the color of the rental or the demands of practical reason. You surface from the subway to find it's fully night and hard to remember the preceding generation's claims for disjunction. You saw the child of a Turkish diplomat fall from a penthouse balcony, curled up on a floor model at the Soho crate and barrel when you received the terrible news from a poem that probably dates from 1939 address to an adjacent posterity green eyeshadow and surprising gentleness of the saleswoman who asks if I'm okay must be harnessed if we are to surpass camp and apathy plain clothes security closing in you feel emancipated briefly from fragmentation when the D train emerges onto the Manhattan Bridge, vertically polarized light entering the water, 76 stories of rippled steel refusing to be actual all at once. Stand and offer your seat to an old man who isn't there. Listen politely to his demand for a theater that combines distance and empathy, false proscenium lit to reveal evaporating value, the delicate carnation that follows heat and glare. Two. I came into the cities at a time in which the service industry employed a swift underclass of Spanish-speaking laborers. I came into the cities when the art world's post-medium pluralism valorized stupidity. In the midst of weather patterns of increasing extremity, I came into the cities, unsure if I should say gracias to the man refilling my glass, notes of chlorine, antidepressants, and trace amounts. One way was enumerating the bad forms of alienated collective power, breathing hot particles from Japan, bundled debt. Another way was passing beyond the reach of friends to internalize an allegory, tracking the dilation where aorta meets heart, minor tremor in the hand. Part of me wants to say there is a mock oratorical mode capable of vitalizing critical agency, and part of me wants to praise the maple's winged samaras, the distance achieved from the Paris tree, parent tree, but mainly I want to argue there one thing, real if indefensible, like cities in time spinning as they fall. My role in the slaughter doesn't disqualify the beauty I find in all forms of sheltered flame, little votive polis, that you eat while others starve does not refute the promise of dimming house lights, weird fullness of the instant before music that I ventriloquize when I address you is the marker of my voice, important source of syrup and tone wood coming to you live from the ellipses of compatier and vase, grave air of a masterpiece, its notes of ozone and exhaust, jasmine and trace amounts, tracking the dilation of new forms of private temporality into public architecture, glass curtains as they dim. Three, the ideal is visible through its antithesis like small regions of warm blue underpainting, and this is its late July realization. I'm sorry, I know you were expecting more. I'm not going to lecture the neighbor kid with the hydrant key about conserving water for posterity until I can think of a better idea for the spontaneous formation of a public, however brief. By the time you read this, if you were close enough to read this, if you are reading this, a threat to the first person was called in, prompting its evacuation, a panic you should take advantage of in order to compose a face, test predicates against, walk to Sunset Park and watch the soft wing kites at magic hour when light appears imminent to the lit, warm blue scattering and the gaps between buildings and print, you can feel the content streaming. 
The ideal is a kind of longitudinal subject in which the poem is a note saying, where I left you keys and a bottle of green wine, sea rise visible in the compound eye, mosaic image, flicker effect, in which objects must move in order to persist. Thus, the preference of bees for wind-blown flowers. Thus, the analogy collapses like a colony, prompting its evacuation. But the formal capacity for likening still shines through its antithesis, feel it misfiring, vaguely erotic disappointment that combines distance and empathy, carnation fading from the contrails, trying to conceive in a ready-to-assemble bed as the metropole shifts east. I believe there is a form of apology, both corporate and incantatory, that could convene the future it begs for leniency, inherited dream you can put anything in, antithetical blue, predicate green. I have um, two little kids and there's, we've been, in the summers we've been going to Prospect Park where the firefly populations are back up and there's been a lot of, um, there've been a lot of learning experiences about like the difficulty of catching the firefly without killing the firefly. Um, and that's kind of, inspired, that's, that's in this, that's, that's given rise to this, to this poem, some of those conversations. It's called the Camperdown Elm, and it has to do also with being around the Camperdown Elm and Prospect Park, which was, you know, Marion Moore's tree, and thinking about her work here as well. So the Camperdown Elm. Our children do not mean their numbers are up the fireflies to kill them when they cup around the soft body's light. Music softens features the way a mild solvent softens the acrylic yellowing in time. The old habit of sentience after a storm, the light I've come to feel okay ascribing features, the Camperdown Elm because it was celebrated in a poem. They've put a gate around, cupped it as a friend is cupped, heated glass along the meridians of her body, slow release of energy. She is in sustainable agony most of the time. I place a firefly in each cup. I place them in the branches of and ask it to watch over her, the grafted elm, its weeping habit. Even though the light is cold, the wings damaged, cupped, flame of it, the toddler says the surface varnish has dissolved. She wants to know if it makes honey that glows in the dark. Slow pulse of it, the interval shorter on warm nights. It won't kill you the pathetic fallacy, my August fallacy, so that fall, so that September has a flaw in the glass of it, where it catches, is damaged lightly and released. How long have I been reading for? Four minutes. Four minutes. <laughs> I'm a little worried about reading too little and I'm very worried about reading too much but I think, I think we're okay. This is called um, The Pistol. It's a very recent poem. Now that nothing has been done before, you can speak of the stigma, style and ovary, fourth whirl of the flower. You can run your tongue along the lips of the sleeping. No one has touched your hair, described the fall of it. Now you can smoke indoors around your daughters, windows open to spring, nights that flare up in winter, words like transparent shells attached to the elms, maples, and ash. I hear the people because tonight is recycling, picking through glass as I write you. Slow pour of metal into the mold, my speech direct because recycled, the prohibition against feeling broken like bread above the sill, an inferior mirage above their heads, minute gaps, impulses pass through blue sparks rise in the dark fourth wall of the flower splits at maturity, releases sentiment, follicle fruit of it, soft space between bones of the skull where dreams are knitting delicate fallacies. Now that bees 
the coral and ice white noses of bats. It's time to write the first poem in English, each line the last, small rain turning glass. A few years ago, um, one of my heroes was John Berger, and a few years ago I had the chance to go and meet him. People were making a movie about him, and I just kind of tagged along to get to go to this alpine village where he lived and to get to be around him for a couple of days. And before um, we went, he told everybody who was involved that they had to read all these Victor Serge books, the great revolutionary Victor Serge. So we all read a whole lot of Victor Serge books because we thought there would be like a kind of seminar or something. And then we got there, and he just never even mentioned <laughs> Victor Serge. He just wanted us to all read Victor Serge. Um, and this poem came out of that. It's a poem for uh, Berger called Contre Jour, which is that, you know, against the day, it's that effect like when you, when you um, take a photograph of someone against a bright light source so it obscures their, their features. Um, so it's Contre Jour, it's for John Berger. The light that changes, the light that goes out when you pass under it, the unsafe intersection and the ghost bike, the light that turns out to be a flame and the bulb designed to flicker. Obviously, city lights, the necklace lights of bridges, lights of planes are part of this, especially flashing or extinguished, trick candle sparking in the cake, little star sparking, wintergreen in the mouth, the speech of it decaying, flash of the muzzles as they chased Victor Serge across the rooftops, the snow blue in the light and the burning manuscripts and Paris, the city of the light that changes in the mouth. I wish I'd known you were a fan of light. I would have saved some for you. Moonlight on pavement set aside for you in factories and prisons, obviously, and Moscow burning, obviously, and the throat I left a light on for you, Victor Serge, and the last century, century of last cigarettes. The light decay gives off the cold light of the living organism in the open seas in Oakland, some old paintings. Because like ash, it scatters, I thought that I might sing. Because it dies repeatedly in Mexico, penniless, penniless in Spain, I thought that I might speak openly with you in photographs. If I appear, then obviously I'm penniless because appearance is the last resort of light. Victor Serge, in his letters, in translation, our liquidation has been prepared, and if they call your name, my hands are tied. My role is limited to passing through glass, to letting the glass bend light around small corners and translucent wings. Espejitos is its Spanish name, but Spain was lost. Little mirrors whose borders are opaque. Can I just say one thing? about how everything is lost, one obvious thing about the threat of sky glow and the need for dark oases, and could surge be sighted, traveling at a constant speed through opaque objects like these pages, or would that be singing? Because like ash, when you passed under it, because like snow, blue systems. I thought I'd end um, by reading a poem that I wrote in Berkeley a long time ago. Um, it's the dedication to my, to my book of poems, Mean Free Path. So this is, it's called Dedication. For the distances collapsed, for the figure failed to humanize the scale, for the work, the work did nothing but invite us to relate it to the wall, for I was a shopper in a dark aisle. For the mode of address equal to the war was silence, but we went on celebrating doubleness, for the city was polluted with light and the world warming. For I was a fraud in a field of poppies. 
For the rain made little affective adjustments to the architecture, for the architecture was a long lecture lost on me, negative mnemonics reflecting weather and reflecting, reflecting. For I felt nothing which was cool, totally cool with me, for my blood was cola, for my authority was small involuntary muscles in my face, for I had had some work done on my face, for I was afraid to turn left at intersections, for I was in a turning lane, for I was signaling despite myself the will to change, for I could not throw my voice away. For I had overslept, for I had dressed in layers for the long dream ahead, the recurring dream of waking with alternate, al alternate endings she'd walk me through for Adiana, for Adi. Actually, I'm going to read you one last poem. I hate it when poets do that. I've never actually made the mistake I'm making now of having announced the last poem and then reading another. I screwed it all up, but here. But I, I want to read. I want to read you one, one more. It's very short, called "No Art," um, which is the last poem in a in a recent volume. Thank you again um, for for coming and for listening. Tonight, I can't remember why everything is permitted or what amounts to the same thing forbidden. No art is total, even theirs. Even though it raises towers or kills from the air, there's too much piety and despair, as if the silver leaves behind the glass where politics and the wind they move in and the chance of scattered storms. Those are still my ways of making, and I know that I can call on you until you're real enough to turn from. Maybe I have fallen behind, am falling, but I think of myself as having people a small people and a failed state and love more avant-garde than shame or the easy distances. All my people are with me now the way the light is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben, and thank you all for coming. Mo's Books is here with, I think, a couple of volumes left distributed across all those genres I referenced before. Go peruse them, come talk to the poet, I mean essayist, I mean novelist, and then go back out into your day. Thank you. Come back in May for the student reading. <laughs>